Good evening, everyone, and welcome to NMP Talk Show. Today, I'm with Byron Mukansi, who will be helping me steer this ship uh, to the right course. Welcome, Byron. Thanks, Neo, and welcome to our listeners. Yes, we have, we're happy that you are joining us as a visiting co-host. So today, we're streaming on Twitter, we're streaming on Riverside.fm, and we're also streaming on Telegram. So we want to welcome everyone that has connected already on these uh, platforms. We're speaking or we're discussing a disease that has plagued humanity for centuries, and this is tuberculosis, also known as TB. Um, this bacterial infection affects the lungs and can spread to other parts of the body, causing serious illness and even death. While TB is curable with proper treatment, it remains a major global health challenge, particularly in low, in low and middle income countries. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, TB is one of the top 10 causes of death worldwide. And it is estimated that over 10 million people became ill in, with TB in 2019 alone. That's a big number there. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Ian, um, welcome to our show. Uh, you're the best person to, to confirm these details for us. <laughs> and um, Dr. Ian, I mean, Professor Ian Sen is uh, a director at the Clinical HIV Research Unit, University of Vatasrand, in the Faculty of Health Science and Chief Executive Officer of Right to Care Group of Companies. Doctor, this is... Yeah, these are epaulets of note. Welcome to our show, Doctor. Yeah, so thank you very much. I need to correct the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Right to Care. I recently stepped down from that position okay. to focus right, on okay. science. I am still helping Right to Care with its uh, transition strategy, but um, essentially I'm, I'm hoping to move more into uh, program activities, innovation, and science. Okay. Those, those are big terms for me. <laughs> <laughs> but thank, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to learning more about uh, tuber, tuber, hey, that's a big word, tuberculosis, uh, better known as TB. Maybe we, we, for the sake of the show, we'll just refer it as TB. So, Professor, uh, just tell us about this disease, tuberculosis. Uh, how, what is it and how it's been transmitted? So there's a bacteria um, known as Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it is uh, transmitted from person to person through respiratory droplet spread. So basically people uh, coughing up TB bacilli and others in their vicinity inhaling those uh, to then become infected first in the lung, but indeed the disease can manifest in uh, multiple organs of the body. Uh, it is um, a very important cause of disease in Southern Africa and South Africa in particular. Um, there's a whole host of socioeconomic reasons why we have not come to grips with tuberculosis in South Africa, uh, including the overlap with HIV in our country. But it is a global infection. It's a global disease. Uh, the um, middle and lower income countries are most affected. The numbers that you uh, were quoting uh, were indeed WHO numbers. And they were, uh, you know, those are the correct numbers. Um, South Africa has the highest incidence of tuberculosis worldwide. Uh, we contribute about 20% of the cases um, across the globe. Um, and we, it has been a neglected disease because uh, TB treatment, many of the drugs invented 20 and 30 years ago and longer, um, has uh, been an effective treatment. Uh, there was not, it's a slow, indolent disease, slow, slow in its development and onset. And uh, there was not much research interest in the disease um, until uh, recently when new diagnostics, new treatment options, and uh, also the socioeconomic impact 
um, has been evaluated and uh, to show that in fact it is one of the leading causes of of, of uh, life years lost if, I, if one could put it that way both in the acute uh, illness of tuberculosis but also importantly a term that is becoming widely appreciated and that is uh, uh, post TB lung disease disability and the long-term consequences of being having had tuberculosis yeah, sure. Wow. It's, it's, it's amazing that South Africa is, is contributing so much, eh? Um, it's scary. But now, um, you also spoke about uh, it affects the, the low and middle class. Um, how has COVID-19 pandemic affected the, the diagnosis of this uh, disease? So South Africa made huge strides, in fact, went forward in leaps and bounds to adopt the new uh, forms of molecular diagnostics. So uh, a uh, very more advanced way of making the diagnosis of TB, which was really important or is really important in those people living with HIV, uh, where a large number of our TB diagnoses are made. Um, they have a low uh, bacterial burden in the lungs uh, and so the normal diagnostics were missing a large proportion of, of TB diagnoses. With the introduction of the gene expert as the first test to be done in all patients who uh, present with symptoms of tuberculosis, we had made huge strides to increase the number of TB diagnoses made. With the onset of COVID, we indeed um, moved a lot of our attention to COVID diagnoses. And indeed also patients were fearful of coming to the clinical service uh, to actually have their respiratory illness diagnosed. And so we saw across our programs a substantive drop in the number of samples that were being sent to the laboratory uh, for TB diagnostics. When I say substantive drop, at certain times in 2020 and 2021, we'd seen an 80% drop in the number of samples sent for TB diagnosis. There came a point in time where every coughing patient actually was considered to have COVID until proven otherwise. And the COVID tests were done, but not the TB tests were done. Mm -hmm. So we have fallen somewhat behind in our and in, in the number. And we we have to do a TB catch up, if I could call it that. Equally spoken, the social distancing and masking that we used during COVID, uh, in fact, also had some benefit, some theoretical benefit, to reduce the transmission of tuberculosis. And so, indeed, we may, in fact, you know, you could have a sort of this equipoise of whether the rates would have gone up because we were making less diagnoses, potentially people presenting later in the course of disease, whereas some of the social distancing and masking may, in fact, have helped our um, uh, the TB transmission. So we don't know post-COVID exactly. We haven't had the time yet to evolve, to actually look at whether our TB incidence rates are declining or increasing. But what we certainly know is that people who have symptoms of TB need to be uh, go through the motions of submitting a, a, going to the clinic, going to their doctor, and submitting a sample for the um, tuberculosis tests. Mm -hmm. So now, Doc, right. I'm, I'm a professor, sorry, uh, Nanel. I just wanted to zoom in back to what you mentioned. So this plague of TB, tuber tuberculosis, um, would you say um, what would be the cause, especially in the lower income bracket and middle class, what would you attribute that to? Because when you look at, in, in some cases, like deafness and other things are usually associated with uh, lower income because of the cleanliness or hygiene or lack of um, access to health facilities, things like that. So what could potentially be what uh, sort of pushes up 
the numbers in these lower income bracket? Yeah, so I, I think one needs to start out with the bacillus and say, you know, has it been around? Yes, it's been around for a number of centuries. Uh, first identified by Robert Koch a couple of uh, centuries ago. I was trying to check the date, but it, it's 1860-something. And, uh, and once identified, it became the focus of uh, real attention. Um, you know, 100 years ago in New York, uh, tuberculosis was one of the most important diseases, respiratory diseases seen amongst immigrants uh, in New York City. Um, certainly, we in South Africa are, have all been exposed to uh, TB. Uh, you would have been exposed in, uh, uh, in, over, in, in sort of communal settings, um, at, at uh, school, at church, in the uh, queue, at, uh, at checkers. And um, uh, normally, the normal immune system would have been partially protected by the BCG vaccine that we give to all of our children at birth and uh, at three time points in the first year of life. And uh, you would have been, so that's a partial benefit. And then your immune system would have responded and and cleared the infection. But a certain proportion of, of people go on, children and adults go on to develop TB uh, lung disease. And they in turn, again, spread to household members, um, to potentially settings of closed uh, community. So overcrowding um, in, in homes. Uh, in households in particular, overcrowding in taxis that have poor ventilation. Uh, and in those settings, they, the uh, TB bacillus would spread again. And then I think the important part is later in life when the immune system is challenged by another um, cause, uh, such as HIV with immune suppression or cancer or diabetes as a risk factor, smoking as a risk factor, mining as a risk factor, mining and silicosis is a important risk factor. Um, that in, then the TB that may be dormant within the body, within the cells of the body, may reactivate at that time. So we have first infection disease, we have reinfection disease, we have um, a, a reactivation of dormant tuberculosis as all different pathways to clinical disease. Once there's once people have clinical disease, we also then have a spectrum of mild, moderate, severe, where severe disease uh, may in fact lead to cavities in the lung. And literally break down and cavities forming in the lung with lots of TB bacilli being puffed up. And uh, obviously, people who are closely living with, uh, with someone with tuberculosis are then at most at risk of developing TB disease themselves. And so, the socioeconomic reasons are overcrowding. Uh, and uh, and you know the other other diseases that go with um, with overcrowding, uh, poverty, malnutrition is an immune suppressant on its own, and and so therefore often lower socioeconomic groups are most more vulnerable. The other thing is that uh, late presentation and TB disease. So somebody who's feeling, you know, has access to good health care has access to a private doctor, goes there quite often, uh, they would uh, be able, they would often be picked up earlier and initiated on treatment earlier than somebody who has poor access to healthcare, perhaps doesn't even have the resources to pay for the taxi to go to the clinic. Um, those, those people would present later with more destructive disease. Wow. The, we, we, we do have a question from one of the doctors, uh, and I, they actually typed it, and I tried to read it, and uh, <laughs> the terminology here is, is no, it's bigger than um, my vocabulary, but I'll try to read it. It says, um, 
He says, a study from Botswana published in October issue of the Journal of Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome in 2019 provides important scientific evidence on the use of Dolutec River. Is that, uh, is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Based anti-retroviral therapy or ART regimen yeah. along with uh, rifampicin based anti-TB regimen for people living with HIV and TB co-infection. The study found that a single daily dose of uh, dilute yeah, produce slightly superior outcomes outcomes than uh, a double daily dose of Doluta Greve. While on the other hand, the World Health Organization currently recommends a double daily dose for people also uh, taking uh, rifampicin. What is your take on the seemingly perceived contradiction? Because in South Africa, we so far opted for one daily dose with TLD first regimen. That's Dr. Rees Itesave. Or say, say the name again, doctor. What was the race Itesa. A race Itesa. Okay, yeah. so I so actually a very complex question. Um, so maybe for the rest of listeners, uh, we use uh, rifampicin based regimens as the first. TB treatment. So in people who do not have drug-resistant TB, uh, rifampicin plus isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol is a standard four-drug regimen taken for two months, followed by a further four months of uh, rifampicin and INH. And uh, that's our six, standard six-month regimen. Now, given that we're in Southern Africa and many of our patients are co-infected with HIV, we need to know how the drugs of TB on, in my right hand, uh, probably you see it as my left, but anyway, my right hand and, uh, and HIV drugs, how those interact. Do some of them cause the drug levels to go up and others uh, drug levels to go down? Often medicines are broken down by the liver, and therefore if we have an enzyme-inducing agent, which we do in rifampicin in my right hand, uh, rifampicin causes liver enzymes to accelerate and potentially break down the HIV medicines. So the Botswana study was really important and stimulated uh, the conversation about do we need to double the dose of uh, adolitegravir and the HIV regimen, understand? In the, one of the three drugs, I should point them out as three drugs. Do we need to double the dose of adolitegravir while giving rifampicin from the four medicines of TB? Or can we just give the same dose, a one single daily dose? So I have, um, I've got news that I can't really share because it's not been published yet and will come out in at the at the conference in, in July where we looked at the pharmacology of dolotegravir and the pharmacology together with rifampicin. I can say to you that the study did not perfectly conclude that it is safe to just give one dose of Dolotegravir per day, and and indeed, so there is a drug there is a drug interaction occurring, and and there is now going to be a prospective randomized study to look at the uh, the the, uh, the two doses. Um, it is conceivable that the lower boundary of the dolotegravir um, pharmacology is good enough. Because in fact we're giving potentially giving more dolotegravir than we need to, the lower boundary may be good enough. But I think the so the study in Botswana appeared to show that, but it was not a fully powered study, and therefore more research is needed. In South Africa, okay. So the second part of this is it's really difficult 
who distributes around the globe a HIV regimen and then say, oh, but there's an exception. If you're taking PD medicines, now we need to add another pill um, to the or existing once a day regimen for HIV. And so we are hoping that indeed we can assure everybody that uh, once a day dolatigavir is good enough. Uh, but for the moment, I think there's still a key point on that question. All right. I think uh, another follow-up question from him has been partially answered by, by your answer there, um, where you said that there's something coming out in July. Um, yes. The about the research, yeah. Uh, so I'll yeah. just leave it there. Um, I think uh, with the professions, you'll be, they'll be able to to get it before most of us do <laughs> the answer to the question. Now, we yeah. do have another question uh, from our audience. Um, she says, uh, the professor said TB infects the lungs first and can come infect the, the other organs. Which organs does it also affect or infect? So in a minority of cases, and the majority is about the lung, but basically in a minority of cases, I think to my years of practice have really seen tuberculosis almost in every part of the body. The, the first time it spreads, it goes to the lymph nodes and often a single large painful lymph node will be a sign of tuberculosis. And we can uh, aspirate that lymph node and send it off, send off that material off for an urgent diagnosis of TB. In its worst form, I think the most severe clinical presentation is TB meningitis, uh, infecting the, the base of the base of the brain, the meninges, the coating um, of the brain. Um, that in fact leads to uh, you know severe clinical presentation. Uh, that can form an abscess in the brain. Uh, I, you know, I don't really want to scare everybody, but basically the the brain, the even the um, abdomen, uh, so TB in the abdomen, uh, TB of the heart, TB pericarditis. Uh, it can be in the uh, urogenital tract, so in the bladder, in the uh, uterus, uh, etc. So it, it can spread around the entire body. In fact, when we find it in multiple organs, uh, we call that miliary TB, um, when it spreads through the blood to multiple sites across the, uh, the body, and requires very more, more specialized treatment potentially longer treatment than uh, standard of care. Mm -hmm. So then, Prof, uh, I mean, yeah. um, this is, for me, this is, this is mind-blowing because we grow up, we know there's TB, right? If you've never had anyone with TB at home or a close relative, TB is just a monster in the corner right there. So in, in, in simple terms, how do I know um, if I'm displaying TB symptoms? And what type of test, or, or I mean, what what can I expect uh, to happen? Will I have a swab like COVID? You know, um, how do I know what symptoms will I show first? And then now after that, what is the next step? I, and I remember you did mention that you'd have to go to a clinic perhaps. But when I get there, what type of test could I expect to happen? Will they draw blood? Will they get like swabs and things like that? Would you like to maybe just clarify that for us? Yes, certainly. Uh, so we essentially start out and say, um, if you have a TB contact, so anybody who um, close to you, who you have spent uh, you know time under one roof, time in the same, breathing the same space, the same air, uh, then indeed you need to be vigilant and you need to con contemplate whether in fact you may have symptoms of tuberculosis. Um, the most important ones are fever, night sweats, loss of weight, uh, productive cough for more than two weeks. So not the flu-like cough that you can have for just a couple of days, but indeed a productive cough uh, that uh, may even include blood in that, in that sputum. So if you're coughing blood, you definitely need to go to clinic 
immediately. <clears throat> and um, essentially, you know, there's loss of weight. So more than, um, than uh, you know, three or four kilograms that you didn't mean to lose, but in fact just happened. Um, mm -hmm. Those are, are very important symptoms of tuberculosis. Uh, then when you decide to go to the clinic, the clinic should be registering those symptoms and should be contemplating that this could in South Africa in a high incidence setting could in fact be tuberculosis. They would ask you to give an, a, a sputum specimen. If you can't cough it up immediately, you know, you come late in the afternoon and now I've got a dry cough, but actually uh, if your cough would be more productive in the mornings, then indeed they would ask you to uh, give a sample of sputum early in the morning. That sputum is taken and uh, a little portion of it is inserted into what is a cartridge. It's a gene, gene expert cartridge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about this size. It uh, goes into a machine that looks not dissimilar to a Nespresso machine. So it's slotted into a machine and it spends two hours replicating uh, by, a, by a polymerase chain reaction, replicating the DNA of tuberculosis and it comes up positive. So what's really important about that system is that we immediately measure right from day one, we measure whether in fact there is resistance to the most important of the TB drugs. And about 8% of those samples come up as rifampicin resistant. And that changes the pathway of treatment. So the pathway for normal drug sensitive TB is the drug regimen that I explained to you. Whereas the pathway today for drug resistant TB through publications that were you know, generated out of multiple universities from South Africa, but working together with Belarus and Russia and other places where drug resistant TB occurs. Um, they, they, they have now settled into a second line oral treatment for TB, a big breakthrough, because in the past we used to commit people to 18 months of treatment. Uh, with injectable antibiotics uh, that, and potentially institutionalization to so hospitalization uh, for a protracted period of time. We've now had, with through good research in the recent period, a breakthrough to show that a new three drug and um, sometimes plus one uh, uh, drug regimen that's taken by mouth orally for six months works. Um, so I think. In terms of the focus on diagnosis, the most important focus is on sputum. But we can take samples from multiple places on, in the body, like the lymph node that I explained earlier, where we can pop a needle in and aspirate a small amount of that um, fluid. Uh, we can get the diagnosis of TB very quickly. In South Africa, we do that by gene expert. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Minister Erin Mozzoledi committed to changing the way that we make the diagnosis of TB, I, I guess it's six years ago. And in fact, we increased the proportion of uh, positive diagnoses very successfully. So back a message, just to repeat them, symptoms, fever, night sweats, loss of weight, and a productive cough for more than two weeks. And certainly if you are coughing uh, blood at any, again, at any point in time. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you for thank that, you. Prof. Uh, Baron, while you check on the, the messaging today on the platform, we do have a question on Telegram. Uh, Hilda, you, do you, you like to unmute yourself and ask the doctor there? Good evening, Neil. Good evening, Doctor. My question is, what is XDRTB? And what would have happened for someone to be infected by XDR? What are the symptoms? How would I know if I've got one? Thank you. 
Thanks, Hilda, yeah. for that. Um, and I apologize, uh, Professor. I, I keep calling you doctor. <laughs> I don't know if it's still appropriate, but Professor, <laughs> okay. That's fine. But you can take it, doctor, take right? it away then. Uh, and, and ear on most days, right? Um, so I, um, so XDR TV is when the person has not only, or the bacillus that is infected the person is not only rifampicin resistant, but also you often isoniazid resistant. So two of my, of my first regimen, the two most important drugs resistant, plus a, to be XDR, a fluoroquinolone resistance, because that was the cornerstone of second line treatment, and goes on to be potentially have resistance to pyrazinamide um, and other of the TB drugs. So the term really only came about in the in KZN. Uh, there was a, a important study amongst healthcare workers that showed that they um, had in fact been infected by a patient uh, with XDR TB, and that so it was possible to transmit it from person to person. Uh, and so healthcare workers are most at risk. How does it come about? Is uh, we conceptually we ask every TB patient to complete their treatment. We take it every day. It's really important. Want to start TB treatment to follow the advice of the clinic. We find it so important that, in, that we try and implement direct observed therapy. Sometimes patients are asked to actually come to the clinic every day to complete their TB regimen or to have somebody observe at home that in fact they are taking the TB treatment daily. With the evolution of partial treatment, we've seen the evolution and development of drug resistant TB. But today, what's important is that we make the diagnosis of either drug resistant TB right at the start of, of treatment or more extended spectrum drug resistance if the person doesn't clear their infection uh, within two months of the initiation of treatment. When that occurs, we culture the organism and do drug sensitivity testing across the spectrum. Is extensive drug resistant TB more aggressive than uh, drug sensitive TB? The answer would be no. Our understanding is that those, uh, it's not a worse infection. It's just that it doesn't respond to first line treatment. And again, in publications by um, uh, my close colleague, uh, Francesca Conradi, and, and colleagues recently in 2022 that are open access journals in, in the in New England Journal of Medicine, they have successfully shown that the second line treatment regimen with uh, badaquiline, uh, 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 now I'm going to, I'm stumbling over the second name, sorry, let me do a quick checker with. Um, Uh, proteonamide, that's right. Uh, uh, sorry, predominant, that's why I'm stumbling. But uh, that going predominant, and it's always in interviews where you stumble, right? Uh, predominant yeah. <laughs> are the three drugs that we are now proposing as the primary regimen um, for uh, drug resistant TB. In fact, we're, gonna, we're giving that for uh, the whole spectrum. So, drug resistant TB pre-XDR TB and XDR TB with a, a very success with very successful outcomes in, in multiple studies published now. So important is the diagnosis again. If you're exposed to somebody with XDR TB, the TB program will be much more obsessive about making sure over uh, a couple of years period that in fact you, you are safe and that in fact the diagnosis is made. Thank you for that. Uh, Baron, do you, you want to read the, the comments there? Yes. Um, so the doctor um, now says, uh, please kindly find out from the professor um, and thank him for that insight. We're looking forward to the July conference to shed more light 
But in the meantime, can we say that those patients with HIV, TB, co-infections are incorrectly treated given so-called indusage of diluted gravia? So at this time, the, the uh, recommendation is uh, to, dependent on which uh, country and which territory, but the recommendation is to double the dose of dolopicida. So give an additional dose of dolopicida. Uh, we, from the Botswana study, it is the early indication. And again, uh, we have to wait for some of the PK data to come out. The PK data suggests that the uh, majority of patients would adequately be treated with a uh, with the normal routine HIV treatment, aligned with the Botswana study. Okay, um, I have a question. Um, how can we engage communities um, that are affected with to look to uh, with TB uh, in the fight against the disease, and what role do they play in shaping prevention and treatment programs? Yeah, so I think I think the most important is that we all recognize that TB is a really important um, disease. Um, I think that I've, I mean I've come certainly come across community members that have said, "Well, there's this person in my community who's been coughing a lot, and we all thought he wasn't well, but you know he you know he carried on." Mm -hmm and nobody paid attention, nobody took that person by the arm and said, you've been coughing for a long time, shouldn't we go to the clinic together? And I think that would be the most important message to, to, to community members. If you have the sense that somebody's losing weight, they're looking somewhat sick, take them by the arm and quietly say, do you not think that we should go to the clinic together? Um, then I think the second important element is to support people with tuberculosis through their treatment. In the long-term studies, you know, when I say long-term, five years after TB, uh, we are seeing that in fact it is a very socially and economically destructive disease. We always look at the health cost side and we measure how much does it cost the health system, but we fail to understand how much does it cost the household. Uh, often people may uh, be put off work. If they permanently employed, they have the ability to take sick leave, but if they self-employed or generate their own income, they may in fact end up not being in a position to earn an income. Um, stigmatizing people living with tuberculosis is, is not, not correct because we, in the vast majority of cases, they would be TB sputum negative. In other words, they're no longer coughing up active tuberculosis bacilli within two weeks of starting treatment. And so a much more accepting, supporting engagement of people living with tuberculosis is um, where we would like to see community engagement go. And then contact tracing and assisting family members to also be um, a go to clinic and be uh, diagnosed or not diagnosed, be investigated for TB is really important. Um, my sense is that we have not quite measured how debilitating tuberculosis is in long term when you've, when you've had TB. What, what we do know is that TB, people who present early with mild tuberculosis do extremely well, whereas people presenting with severe cavitatory tuberculosis do much worse, and that becomes a long-term disability. Well, thanks for that, Prof. A, so, uh, th oh. thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> there, I'm going. Yeah, yeah, let me jump in. Let me jump in quickly. Um, Doc, you, uh, sort of, Professor, you you spoke about um, this thing lying dormant in your lungs, um, and then there will be a, a trigger at the later stage. So I'm talking from the side where maybe you have 
um, had a family member with TB and that you helped uh, to take care for uh, uh, for them. And um, later in years, if I was, I was the caregiver, what would be the trigger if I did have um, the dominant TB uh, uh, disease or virus in my lungs? What could be the, the trigger? I don't know if uh, my, my question... Yeah, no, no, it's a good question and it has two parts yeah. to it. So, so the caregiver, right? The caregiver part. Yeah. Um, yeah. So during the active phase of tuberculosis, we we are moving more and more to protecting the caregivers and family members with masking and social di distancing. In other words, you, you essentially, if you're directly caring, you, somebody is so sick that you need to be the caregiver, then indeed. You, you probably need to be masking while you're in the same room as the individual who is sick. If we're able to separate people and give them their own space to sleep in rather than with the entire family, which is not always possible, but we, and we recognize that, but where it is possible, you need to do that. So there's no point in a couple sleeping together where the one has TV and the other doesn't. Um, we do recommend prophylaxis for close um, household contacts. So, uh, that, that is uh, in, uh, being undertaken, particularly for drug, uh, and the studies for drug resistant TB and household contacts are actually underway through the AIDS clinical trials group, uh, where a large international study is being conducted to see if the newer uh, drugs for TB are better than isomyosis prophylaxis. There's a big debate in the TB community as to whether we should be prophylaxing a, a much wider audience with a month of uh, TB treatment, effectively drugs, two drugs effective against TB. And that debate is, is ongoing. Um, we haven't really a, a policy decision as yet, but we certainly know that close contacts should be should receive prophylaxis. And then the dormancy is uh, in the cells, the the white cells of the lung. To be to be honest, at, at least eighty percent of South Africans have been exposed to TB and probably have some form of bacilli lying dormant within the lung uh, cells. And the triggers for reactivation of TB are related to immune deficiency, and they occur later in life. At this time, it's more about early diagnosis. So everybody needs to be aware that, again, the symptoms, night sweats, loss of weight, fevers, and a persistent cough uh, need to, in fact, be diagnosed. Early diagnosis of TB has really, really, really good outcomes, and uh, the treatment thereof is really important. In the perfect setting, we should be avoiding smoking, obviously, and we should be avoiding, uh, um, we, we have got a special emphasis now and looking for TB in the mining sector, and, keep, and uh, trying to prevent TB in the mine uh, in minors. Um, the correlation with HIV is really important, and I think all HIV clinics look out for uh, people developing symptoms of tuberculosis. Uh, and uh, certainly, antiretroviral therapy is really important to ensure that the CD4 count is as as close to normal as possible. To prevent the incidence of tuberculosis, um, and the other risk factor that's uh, that's emerging or becoming more important is diabetes. So diabetics are more at risk of developing tuberculosis. So uh, with time, I think the most important uh, aspects are close contact need prophylaxis for TB. And the, the, then the other, other important part is if you do have a history and you do have a family member that had tuberculosis, you need to keep that in mind uh, should you develop symptoms of TB and rather go to the clinic early rather than late. Yeah. 
no. Thanks, Prof. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's clear that uh, many of us are so ignorant to it. I mean, we are oblivious to how how dangerous TB is. I remember growing up, you you, you always saw billboards, they're speaking about TB, but as kids, you never really understood. And as you grow up, because um, the health sector is also growing and, and improving, um, they're able to mitigate some of those old risks that we had to a point where it seems like it's it's non-existent anymore, but it, it so much is alive and it's existent. We just need to educate ourselves. So, I heard you mention something quite interesting, that um, you also find that in the long term, um, those who had TB in the past, they 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 start to feel um, that uh, weight. Um, um, those who were self-employed, uh, obviously, but their families struggle in themselves. So. Is there, Prof, a maybe what we could call a support group um, for those who, who have suffered with uh, TB or resources available um, in the country or elsewhere that are used to at least help and, and support those ones or support groups where one can just go and they just educate themselves as a TB sufferer, maybe something to expect in the future? Um, is there something like that? If there's any, please, could you share something about that with us? So Nair and I met by chance, and uh, hence the interview. Um, and we, we were actually at um, at a venue together where um, uh, the long-term TB sequelae. Um, we have a study that's now completed the first five years of follow-up of a cohort of, of TB patients, uh, and um, the WHO has also come out with statements on TB disability. And interestingly, the most important consequence of TB turns out to be um, mental health and neurologic disease. So mental health being how, do, do, how, how disabling has this TB occurrence been to my own mental well-being? Do I still mm -hmm. feel well vital able to be an active member of the community uh, economically active but also socially active and as many as a third of patients post tuberculosis um, have uh, demonstrated features or score on mental well-being assessments as not being totally well in other words they do not feel well about themselves. Uh, that's a high rate, you know, one third of people. That can be very debilitating. And the neurologic complications of TB, including some of the drug side effects, um, I think are underappreciated. In terms of community support groups, part of the team that looked at, uh, that, that are looking into um, support, more social support for TB, is a group in South Africa called TB Proof, as in I am, uh, I can I can proof myself from TB. Uh, P R O O F uh, is a group of healthcare workers who themselves uh, became infected that have developed a number of support uh, groups and support interactions uh, for uh, particularly for healthcare workers, but also for the general community. Um, and I would highly recommend that engagement with TB Proof uh, would be a very good support group. Oh, thanks, Prof. Thank you for, for taking that um, question, uh, Prof. We do have um, Daboho on the line, on Telegram. Um, Daboho, you can unmute yourself. Um, if Evening in. Sorry, it's not a question, but just to say thank you so much for coming on the show. This is, has been a most enlightening and just an amazing um, explanation of the disease and uh, what we can do and how it uh, manifests itself. I really appreciate the time. Thank you for, for that. Um, and do we still have um, any questions from Telegram? Um, we do also have those that are connected on Twitter. If you do have uh, any question, please uh, post them on there and uh, we can read it to, to the doctor. 
but um, we're looking at the time now. We only have 10 minutes left. Uh, do, uh, Professor, can you believe that time flew so fast? Mm. <laughs> it seemed like uh, one hour was too long, but um, it really did. And thank you for explaining what TB is. Um, I'd like to um, reflect on what Byron had said, that when growing up, you always saw those billboards you know, uh, on the side of the road, but it, it never dawned on you that this is a pandemic, in fact. And um, um, what I want to ask is for for the schools, do we have programs um, uh, that can educate the, the learners about TB? Because remember, in a class, you, you'd have um, 30, you know, in, in a classroom, and if one has has uh, TB, uh, it's easier to to spread it all around, and then they carry it to to their families. So it's a chain effect. Do you have programs that you, um, or maybe South Africa has that goes to schools to educate or to, you know, um, administer some form of um, medicine, maybe to pre to prevent that. Uh, yeah, okay, so you again ask a couple of questions in one, right? So I think <laughs> I want to break that down into the schoolhouse programs uh, that are uh, run by the Department of Basic Education. Um, there is a, there's an interface that's happening um, administratively between the Department of Health and the Department of Basic Education to expand the type of services that would be offered to school-going children. Uh, we, we have uh, an incredible number of schools across the country. In fact, we have more schools than clinics. And so some yeah. of the arguments being made is that we should, in fact, uh, take the opportunity um, to uh, make diagnoses uh, particularly due to catch up of vaccines, vaccinations for children uh, within the school health program. And uh, varying execution, varying degrees of success. Some provinces do better, others do less well. Uh, it's always a question of budget and bu budget prioritization. Uh, but we're seeing some really remarkable success with the integration of COVID vaccine into the uh, Department of Basic Education programs. And, and then um, I think in terms of providing medicine, so the second part of your question is the one that's unanswered. Should we be giving TB prophylaxis to all of our children for one month at some point in time during the school uh, years to try and prevent the long-term incidence of tuberculosis. So should we, and I don't think those studies have been done, and I don't think they have really, we have really worked it out yet, um, but we do know the types of medicines that are available, particularly the combination of INH and rifapentin, um, that indeed one month of INH with repentance potentially. So someone like me who really wants to think over, the, you know, what's the impact going to be over 30 and 50 years, I would be in favor of, of developing a program where we could in fact give prophylaxis to all children, not just uh, those of, that are contacts, but in fact to all children. Um, I do think eventually we will do the studies and we will look for incident tuberculosis in those children and follow them up for a decade uh, and then to actually see if um, we can prevent uh, TB at a community level. We do know that actually we can map South Africa and we can map where TB is occurring and down to um, very uh, close communities. Uh, we know that, for instance, the Western Cape, for relatively unknown reasons, has a higher incidence of tuberculosis. Uh, we know that uh, the, the Perry mining communities and the communities from where those miners come from 
uh, in you know because of, of migrant labor, uh, they that those communities have a higher incidence of tuberculosis. So it, it's conceivable to me that we could map the country and say in these sub-districts there's a higher incidence of tuberculosis, in these communities there's a higher incidence of tuberculosis, and focus our attention on preventative interventions in those communities. And I, I think that's, that's where we're going in the next three to five years. Well, that means it's time up for our show. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Jensen, for, um, you know, elaborating and clearly explaining what TB is. Now we do understand. And uh, Baron, uh, I think we will we, we'll be on the lookout, especially for our family members day, um, uh, for, for those um, symptoms that they, they might have, and we just help them. Um, Thank you all uh, that have connected on Telegram. We really appreciated your comments, your questions, and all the, the doctors that also connected. I know uh, some of them have, and one of them was possibly a representative <laughs> by asking the question there. So we really thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to the next show where we can have the same engagement with uh, Professor Hopefully, maybe after July, that and he can explain uh, what the seminar was all about and uh, give us more details on it. But we really do appreciate uh, joining us on the show. Um, any closing remarks from you, Professor? Uh, no, thank you very much. And uh, you know, this I can carry on forever on all kinds of topics. Um, and I enjoy this interaction. And uh, you're welcome to call, call on me for infectious diseases. Topic. We'll definitely do so. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> Baran, any closing remarks? Yes, yeah, no. I just uh, wanted to also to say thank you to Professor Yensan. Um, you know, it's um, ignorance is, is what's killing so many. And I think we have all learned during the pandemic that we still have so many epidemics that we are faced with. So educating ourselves and uh, for you, Professor, making yourself available and educating us like this, um, I, we definitely would like to have you back on the show to elaborate further because we have tons of questions, but the time didn't allow us to, to cover all of that. Mm -hmm. But we really are grateful for your time and thank you for joining us. All right. My name is Neil Morapedi and my co-host Baron Mukansi. We're saying thank you so much for joining us. And till next time, see you then. See you then. <laughs> Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.